thank you very much for, for organizing. So that's that's really a fantastic opportunity, and I think it's a great chance now to, after all this corona things, uh, it's good to restart these activities on the curvilinear magnetism, 3D magnetism workshops, which were uh, like before corona, and now Claire was doing um, at the DPG meeting, and this spring now this uh, this workshop I think it's uh, is developing very very well. Uh, so thank you guys for pushing it forward. Uh, so as, as you can see, uh, we have a lot of collaborators here, uh, and uh, I will try to cover work uh, which is done by many of you also sitting here in this room. So that's why I take a chance to also thank you personally for, for <coughs> their contributions. Uh, my name is Denis Makarov. I'm from Helmholtz Centrum Dresden Rosendorf, and uh, uh, that's uh, obviously in Dresden in Germany, uh, which is here at the east part of Germany. So we are somewhere. Now we are somewhere about here, and uh, Dresden is uh, simply on another side of, uh, of, of Germany in a very nice corner uh, where you have Poland, where you have Czech Republic and Germany meeting together. So it's a very cultural place and historic place. Therefore, visiting Dresden is not only for science very pleasant, but also for cultural explorations. Uh, it's very rich in, uh, in industry. So microelectronics industry is uh, actually also in Dresden with uh, global founders, Infineon, um, and uh, other companies, which can be attractive for people also doing uh, STT, MRAM, or MRAM in general. Uh, we are located in Dresden, which is one of a few cities in Germany which has all four non-university research organizations like Max Planck, Fraunhofer, Leibniz, and Helmholtz, and uh, Helmholtz is exactly where we work. Uh, it was established about 70 years back as a counterpart of a research center Julich. It's a nuclear research center in former uh, German Democratic Republic. And uh, now we don't have reactor anymore, but uh, it's still it's a rich history, which is actually there. For about 10 years, we are a member of the Helmholtz Association, which, uh, boosted, which boosted budget a little bit and uh, made a lot of uh, exciting development with, uh, in principle, infrastructure possible. So the budget is very large, as you can see, but uh, it's dedicated to large-scale facilities. So uh, Helmholtz, for those who are not from Germany, uh, is a counterpart of uh, national labs in the US, for example, right? something, something like that. Uh, and uh, it means that a lot of money are going into this uh, maintaining of facilities. Right? So that's not the money which, uh, like for example, goes to my group, let's say, in this way. Right? Um, but uh, what is in important here is to tell that uh, Helmholtz covers a lot of uh, strategically relevant areas. We work in our center in three out of, I think, seven, uh, which is energy, health, and matter, and uh, materials. That's primarily where we are working. It's, of course, uh, located here in matter. Uh, and uh, uh, what is interesting maybe for this community sitting here that uh, we can offer also a lot of uh, very interesting uh, facilities for material scientists, for magnetism research. Uh, for example, if you work with antiferromagnets or something where you need for your scientific case very high magnetic fields, you can apply for us as a user facility uh, for a high magnetic field lab. So it means that you can carry out your experiments at fields something like up to 100 Tesla, uh, which is not for every experiment maybe useful, but you can do nuclear magnetic resonance, you can do electron spin resonance, you can do basically transport at very high fields, which sometimes is very, very important. You can modify properties of your samples. Today we heard from Kai, very exciting possibility to uh, manipulate properties of the sample simply by putting hydrogen, for example, in your material, like uh, palladium adsorbs hydrogen. So in this case, you can do permanent change with, for example, implanting heavy or light ions, magnetic or <coughs> non-magnetic ions, in your magnetic samples in order to modify their properties, like spin-orbit coupling can be modified or exchange interaction can be modified by ion beam implantation. Uh, we have Center for High Power Radiation Sources. It's basically LINAC and uh, linear accelerator, which basically has a lot of uh, secondaries, like a petawatt laser, which produces everything you can imagine, including terahertz. Right? And uh, terahertz is very interesting for magnetism research, also for antiferromagnet research or high frequency research. And uh, if you're interested in any of these kind of uh, possibilities, simply let me know. I will be happy to bring you in touch with uh, beamline scientists. I'm, I'm not beamline scientist there, but uh, I'm happy to be like. Uh, Established contact, let's say. Uh, that's a team uh, activities of which I will present. So this is uh, this my group, Intelligent Materials and Systems. And as you can see, it's a very diverse. It's uh, diverse in terms of age, and diverse in terms of expertise. We have uh, here physics, material scientists, electrical, mechanical engineers, and chemists, microbiologists. 
And this appeared to be very, very important because uh, um, these uh, activities which we are doing, where we try to combine fundamentals and application activities of uh, magnetism in geometrically curved surfaces, uh, requires a lot of uh, drive from different disciplines uh, which uh, needs creativity. And that's the way how we try to boost creativity by simply trying to put different communities together. Right? So that's, that's uh, for PhD students uh, difficult, uh, but at the same time, eventually it becomes very, very profitable because you can learn by yourself a lot of things. Yeah? So this is something which is important. And uh, if you think about curvature in general, you, you meet curvature everywhere. Therefore, we work with fluidics, for example, where we have channels, we push fluids, we push uh, in this fluid some different droplets. And even the Coriolis force is something which is very, very classical and very useful thing. That's uh, already something which is related to curvature, right? So in fluidics, you immediately experience a lot of curvature. And uh, this is very useful, of course, because you can work here with uh, cells, cell biology. And this is, again, important if you want to uh, discuss something related to biocompatibility of your sensors, right? So students, again, can just do it, but not uh, outsource it to some collaborators. Uh, where uh, somebody tells them what is happening. Uh, we work also on magnetoelectric antiferromagnets, and again, as you can see, I immediately recognize here, in our case, it's chromium oxide collinear antiferromagnet. And what is important there is uh, if you will create some kind of obstacles, you know, you just simply pattern your sample, you will have a chance to pin domain walls, antiferromagnetic domain walls. And now you can uh, study, investi like investigate with, uh, in this case, it's a NV microscopy measurements, uh, you can investigate how antiferromagnetic domain walls in collinear antiferromagnets uh, in, in like counterplay with uh, or interplay with, uh, with boundaries. And this, this appears to be also very, very exciting and fundamentally very new, right? That's uh, very surprising how little we know about antiferromagnets. Also, antiferromagnets, it's, uh, uh, well, Louis Niel and uh, Olivier probably will mention also a little bit about uh, history in Chernobyl, it's already a very, very classical field. But in principle, whatever you do with antiferromagnets appears to be very new, very surprising. Uh, you can integrate them. You can do a lot of strain effects in antiferromagnets. So it's completely different, uh, different and very exciting field where curvature also can play a very important role. This is a little bit closer to the topic of the talk um, because somehow you need to prop. Uh, like there was a remark already, not only fabrication is important, but also you have to characterize your samples. And uh, in principle, a lot of things, what, what we do with characterization is not only imaging, X-ray or electron uh, tomography or holography, but you also can do transport. Because if you want to speak about devices, you actually need to push some current and measure some voltage. Otherwise, um, uh, about integration, you cannot really discuss too much. And that's exactly one of the ways how you can use geometry, for example, very, very simple way in order to break center symmetry of your structure. Uh, in order to induce new effects. New effects which are not specific to this material. If you will take Vismut, Vismut is a centrosymmetric material. So in principle, any second order effects will be simply by symmetry forbidden in this material. But if you will take a Vismut pass and you curve it in a semicircle, you will necessarily break uh, symmetry, like center, center of inversion will be broken there. And in this case, you can have, for example, so-called nonlinear hole effect. It's geometric effect, which can come on top of something which is happening actually on the surfaces of Vismut, which makes it very, very exciting. So this is already one of the hints where, where you can tell that curvature can be very useful, even on a structural level, which is complementary to what we usually do in material screening, where we try to dope or strain our materials or create heterostructures in order to break center symmetry in that or another way. Geometry gives it to you by, by itself very naturally. So that's one of the very important aspects, which I think is basically a red line through my talk. As I showed you, Vismut and fluidics and everything, so obviously curvature effects are, and Coriolis uh, I mentioned. So basically, uh, curvature is not only in magnetism important. So primarily, actually, the effects of curvature are explored in different communities, but also in magnetism. Okay? So not in magnetism and other communities, but other way around. And uh, what you see here, it's uh, a lot of excitement about uh, exactly the structural symmetry break in uh, differently uh, ordered materials. It can be superconductors, semiconductors, topological insulators, 2D, magnetic materials, very anti-ferro, ferro magnets, of course. And uh, there are a couple of families of effects. And uh, I think uh, what is important maybe to distinguish between quantum effects and classical effects, okay? 
um, uh, because uh, in many papers also it's uh, sometimes very much confused. So uh, quantum effects in principle by definition, uh, it happens uh, uh, at the curvature ID, which is compared to the Fermi wavelength. Yeah, so De Broglie wavelengths of electrons at Fermi level. So if the curvature is comparable to that scene, which is for typical materials, is a couple of nanometers, then you can expect uh, quantum effects in your material. Uh, if curvature is um, what we usually explore in experimental uh, magnetism is in the range of, let's say, 100 nanometers, or um, I think Sam was showing today like 40 nanometers. Yeah? So this is typically related to classical effects where just the geometry, simply the shape of the sample, sometimes boundaries, determining or topology of the geometry, it determines the properties or responses of your material. So in principle, everything what I will discuss in my talk is actually here, right? So for example, in Wismut, this thing, um, also here you are like a micrometer and everything very, very small and nice. Uh, this is absolutely classical geometric effect which is happening. So there is nothing quantum in it, okay? So that's very important uh, as a remark. We will discuss now classical effects of shape. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what we do, if there are questions, simply ask me because, you know, like monologue for 45 minutes is terrible. Yeah? So, uh, so simply interrupt me, please. So what, what we will do is, is exactly this, and we, we have nanowires, we have ribbons, we have thin films, we just geometrically curve them, and we try to understand what is a, a consequence on the physical responses, like magnetic transport response or simply magnetic responses of exactly the presence of such geometric curvature. And, uh, uh, I think the most exciting part, at least from my perspective, is uh, that um, uh, in this case, a very fundamental questions on exactly this impact of geometry and topology of geometry on magnetic responses is linked to possibility to explore these materials. And uh, I am in a session which is uh, uh, applications of curvature. Therefore, I, did, I will naturally dedicate a lot of uh, attention in my talk to exactly this part, where uh, we need to simply be creative in trying to understand why such kind of geometrically curved magnetic scene films can be useful. There were a lot of discussions already by Amalio and about neuromorphic and interconnectivity and everything, which of course concerns, or spin eyes and frustrations, um, which of course concerns nanoscale. Yeah? At the same time, your nanoscale films, like 10 nanometer thick film, can be extended on a polymeric foil, and in this case you can also think about why is it useful. Right? And exactly this type of uh, uh, mental exercise, <laughs> I'm not sure whether it's um, from English point of view correct, uh, that's exactly what our students are doing. So they have to create the answer to the question, why is it useful? Okay? So it's very difficult. Um, I will start uh, with this slide. So basically, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a very subjective talk which I'm giving. Okay? So I apologize for that from the very beginning. So this is a curve which I know, the first one from Stuart in 1992, GMR on Kapton. So you take GMR stacks and you put it on Kapton. And that time, that was actually very, very funny because uh, in a paper it was emphasized that the lightness of polymeric substrate compared to silicon substrate can bring benefit for reed heads that time, right? So that was a completely different topic. But lightness is indeed probably the key aspect what polymers can give you, okay? So this is something which is very, very important and I will try to uh, uh, convey this message. And then there were a lot of discussions uh, how to make, uh, it's not only flexible sensors, but also stretchable or mechanically imperceptible when they do not disturb your everyday activities. You can put single sensors, matrices, uh, active matrices, you can condition it on, chi on, on a flexible foil. It can be giant magneto impedance, it can be giant magneto resistance, spin valves, TMR, everything you can imagine, yeah? So it was a lot of development here over the last, uh, well, it's terrible to uh, believe it's uh, more than 30 years. Um, so it's 30 years of development resulted in a lot of discoveries already. And uh, this is something what is state of the art. So this you can buy in a shop. So this is not a problem, you just go to the shop, you can buy magnetic field sensor, it looks like that. Couple of millimeters, couple of, uh, uh, thickness also a couple of millimeter, one millimeter. And this is what you can do now in a batch processing in uh, conventional spotted chambers, right? There is no problem to take 300 millimeter wafer. You can put a stack of them. You can laminate them with polymeric foil of your choice. Can be Kapton, can be polyethylene, can be whatever you, 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 you want in principle. And on these foils, you can do 
uh, deposition of thin films. You can do lithography, you can do G GMR, you can do IMR, you can do basically anything you want, and you can do lithography. So the, the, the question of uh, Olivier was very, very important. Right? So deposition is usually <laughs> relatively straightforward. How do you interconnect and integrate? So luckily at a micro scale, that's uh, absolutely possible even with uh, curved substrate. So you cannot do, you cannot do mask alignment anymore, but you can still do direct writer. So direct writer can write on a 3D uh, geometry. So that kind of works. Uh, I'm not sure whether it works also with electron, but probably, I don't know. Um, but um, let's say as soon as you are at a micro scale, everything is super simple uh, as you know it from thin film processing, nothing special. So here what you see, it's a, well, you, you don't see anything, I think, because it's meant to be transparent. So it's a GMR, which uh, is a giant magnetic resistance sensor, which is basically patterned in a way that you cannot see the, uh, the film, yeah? which you can use for some uh, applications. Uh, and uh, how to do it is very, very simple because there is no change in the technology. You can uh, play a little bit with seed layers and uh, something like that, but in principle, the fabrication remains very, very similar. So for those people who work with thin film deposition, nothing will change, absolutely nothing. So you start with a substrate, you put some anti-adhesion layer, I don't know, usually you put something like rubber, which is uh, synthetic rubber. Then you put uh, foil, which you want to use as a substrate, you do lithography, you do multi-step deposition, multi-step lithography, you define your layers uh, of contacts, of sensors, you do lift off, you do etching, whatever you want. And then you have basically a sensor of your choice. And what you do, you push current and you measure voltage. That's it, right? And this is like a typical curve, like anisotropic magnetic resistance, where you have a change of electrical resistance in the magnetic field. But you measure it now on something which is uh, very, very thin. It's like, let's say, one, two micrometers thick. And this, of course, brings a lot of very in interesting questions uh, for those people who do standard spintronics, basically, uh, the task ends somewhere here, right? But uh, if you do flexible stuff, you have to also do a lot of additional auxiliary work. And uh, as I said, uh, for this you don't need any special equipment. It's a spatter chambers. You can use spatter chambers to work with polymers. <laughs> Bless you. Uh, and uh, what you have to do afterwards, if you have this flexible device, you have to understand what is the stability of the sensor response if you start bending your device. Because if you have it flexible, obviously you want to bend it, otherwise there is not so much reason uh, to have it flexible. So that's a kind of a very natural expectation. And this is exactly what you have to add as a, for example, PhD student to your portfolio of work uh, load, where you have to, for example, bend it to predefined radii, and you have to find, which is very unusual, you have to find the properties when it breaks. So usually what we fabricate, like uh, I'm also condensed matter, uh, physicist, uh, so we work always with, uh, with uh, uh, stiff substrates. So usually you fabricate it and you hope it will never break. So here you have to do it absolutely different. You have to find the, uh, the limits when it starts breaking. So basically you have to torture your sample to the, to the, to the extent that actually it will start failing. And you, uh, you can do it in the static bending, so you basically bend it more and more and more. Or you do it uh, like uh, uh, you bend it a thousand times or million times b between certain predefined radii. And that's exactly the exercises which you have to do to validate the stability of your sensors. Nothing very sophisticated, but it has to come. And actually, this becomes, um, compared to that measurements and compared to fabrication, it's a major part of PhD thesis. Yeah? And then if you have a sensor, uh, so which properties would you like to have here? If it's a magnetic field sensor, obviously you want to have the sensor which detects magnetic field. So that's, that would be kind of a natural expectation from magnetic field sensor. The problem is that um, you, you have uh, also striction effects. So all possible cracking on the film, all possible magnetostrictions will obviously impact your magnetoresistive responses. And that's exactly what you have to do, everything to avoid it. So you want to have a sensor of magnetic field, but not a strain sensor, okay? So usually, striction and everything related to it, like strain effects, it's a kind of Coulomb interaction. It's very, very strong. So compared to magnetoresistance effects, which are, uh, of course, much weaker, okay? So in this case, if you want to bend your device, you need to make sure that everything you do compensates for all possible mechanical kind of uh, magnetomechanical impacts to your sample. So if you have such an effect, 
that you have a sensor which you can bend uh, without affecting magnetoresistance properties too much, then you can start integrating. And that's exactly another aspect where our students are kind of trying to do a lot, uh, a lot of work when they start putting the sensors on hand or in a palm or integrated in a textile and uh, try to do some additional walk around with them. So in principle, you, you can integrate them in something which is, uh, let's say, topical uh, for young people. So in principle, if you will tell them, look, make a compass or something like this, uh, for them it's super boring because compass, you, you can just take a smartphone and you can use it. But uh, if you tell them, yeah, yeah, you make a compass and connect it to, 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 I don't know, VR, oh, that's much more exciting and that's exactly what they want to do, right? So this is very interesting because in principle what you have, you cover the entire uh, range from uh, fabrication to uh, characterization, unusual characterization, and even you try to show it why your work can be useful. So that's exactly what this curvilinear magnetism is about. So on application side, you try to go to demonstrator because, um, uh, let's say in this way, uh, the general person, not really trained in magnetism, has to understand kind of why would you benefit from having flexible magnetic field sensor. Yeah? So that's exactly the type of uh, research what we are doing. The state of the art here is actually quite advanced already. So this is a PhD student, uh, we see what he sees in goggles, right? So it's an immersive VR. So basically it's a virtual reality with goggles. And uh, this is a protein of coronavirus. So in principle he has, because you can do a 300 millimeter, right? So you can do smart skin, which is relatively large. You can laminate it on your skin, obviously, it's smart skin. And you can use a small piece of magnet in order to interact with smart skin. So you, it's, a, it's an art how you have to read it out and everything. But in principle what you see, there are a couple of very exciting things. Not, not only related to that, that he can zoom and uh, rotate this molecule, but the funny thing is that his hands are free. I don't know how much you work with VR, but usually for VR you need some gloves. Um, if, if you don't work with VR, it doesn't matter, but for those who work with VR, you know that there are gloves, and these gloves are motion restraining. So with such kind of smart skins and magnetic interactions, which are actually a reasonably far field interactions, uh, you can make your hands free. So in principle, you can work as you work in everyday life, but you can be in VR interacting with virtual objects. That's something which is quite interesting. So such kind of things you can do already. Uh, what is interesting is this transition. From rigid to flexible, that was what I showed before. Uh, it's, a, it's exciting, but uh, I think there it's already kind of a lot of concepts are there and uh, something what is missing is really product development and uh, technology transfer probably. This is very exciting transition from flexible to printable. And it's conceptually exciting, okay? So this is something which, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, it, it is completely different approach to magnetic field sensors because you still have magnetic field sensor as you know it and you use it for proximity sensing or as switches or something like that. But now you can print it. And you know where it, excitement comes from? Uh, it comes from the possibility that in principle now you can do magnetism research uh, in any chemistry lab. You know, this is something which I, I like very much because, you know, magnetism compared to other communities like semiconductors or printed electronics, it's a super tiny community, you know. We are a very tiny community and that's, um, uh, I mean, it's very, we are very nice, we are like a family, it's a beautiful community, but we are super tiny. And uh, all these uh, other communities, they have no idea what we are doing and what we can do. And this is super bad. Yeah? Uh, because uh, I think we can offer, like Kai was showing today, I, I like your example with a mask very much because in principle you use the same technology as you use for your I don't know, reservoir computing type of nanowires for completely different things which can be useful for other communities. Okay? And it makes our magnetism research a little bit more exposed, which is pretty cool. So the shift between that and that is gigantic. So here you need clean rooms, you need thin films, you need a vacuum, you need lithography. Here in the worst case you can just paint it. You know, you simply buy powder which is conducting at magnetic, you mix it with some polymers which allow you to print. You know, oh, but printing is very general. You can use screen printer, you can use dispenser printer, or if you don't have any of that, you can just take uh, your, your brush and paint. You know, like children can paint. And you can do that with magnetic field sensors. So for this, you don't need any clean room facilities. It's, um, 
uh, it's, I, I think it's very similar to what you guys are doing with Fabit. You know, you just bring something <laughs> to completely different facilities and make it open to other communities. Okay? So this is very, very important. And this transition I like actually very much. Uh, why would you do that? Well, uh, I don't know. But, um, uh, but uh, you, can, you can basically speculate that you can provide some uh, switches because magnetic field sensors is a switch, usually classical switch, it's a magnetic field sensor. Uh, or read switches, I don't know whether some of you work with read switches, you know, like a, a fridge. Uh, you open the door, there is light. You close the door, there is no light. So that's basically a magnetic field sensor is doing that. And uh, you can just make printable sensors of that type. And uh, this can be for advertisement electronics, for printed advertisement electronics. And the problem here is, uh, is actually um, that uh, you can print a lot. So this is, a, this is like a large problem which uh, we don't know how to solve. Because when you come with this technology to printed electronic community, they actually ask you, okay, how, how many, what is the market of magnetic field sensors? Um, uh, well, I, I'm pretty sure that some people know here market of magnetic field sensors. It's uh, some billions, which is super exciting market. It's a lot of like sensors uh, produced. So billions uh, with a lab scale printer you can do it in a couple of weeks. So, so that's a problem, you know, that you can like flood the market of magnetic field sensors uh, using the lab scale printer, not industrial, lab scale printer in a couple of weeks. So basically it's a very interesting possibility now for magnetism community also to come up with a very interesting ideas where actually can you use magnetic field sensors which you can do not in billion and not 10 billion but hundreds of billions of pieces per year, right? So, and such technology does not exist now, okay? So this is very funny. And uh, if somebody, you know, there are many young people here, uh, if somebody will find this, uh, he or she can be rich, actually, right? So that's a lot of potential now with such kind of very simple technologies. Mm -hmm. Composites gives you a lot of possibilities. So, you, you know, magnetic materials are toxic. So this is one thing. Uh, another thing is uh, if you fabricate something, usually you, uh, you, well, you cannot repair it. Right? It's integrated sensor, and I don't believe that uh, there is somebody in this audience who tried to repair a magnetic field sensor. And, uh, like, if it's broken, it's broken, you just trash it, and you buy a new one because it's cheap. Okay? It has several disadvantages, but now just imagine that you want to use the sensors for smart textiles or smart skins or IoT type of application where you will expose the sensor to some kind of uh, strain and you can damage your sensor. So what you, can, uh, you cannot do anything about it with rigid electronics simply because uh, every physicist will tell you that look you take a wafer, you break the wafer and it will not com come back together because of uh, entropy has to increase and all this kind of thing. Yeah? Uh, chemists tell you something different. So the chemist will tell you, well, just uh, there's no problem. Simply, if you cut your skin, your skin will heal. Yeah? So this, there is no contradiction about that, right? So you cut your skin, and there will be a scarf a little bit, like, and then it will heal. Polymers can do it naturally, because you can have dynamic bonds in the polymer. So basically, you can take polymer, you put your magnetic particles in this polymer, and it will self-heal. It's an example of polyboroxyloxane and polydimethylxyloxane. So it's basically two polymers which can reinforce each other. And you put the permalloy particles. And what you can do, as you can see here, there is a crack which you simply, you simply draw it like, like this. And it self-heals. And this is real time. Yeah? So you can really self-heal something. And it's not only mechanical. It's also uh, electrical healing what you can get there. And also if it heals electrically, it can also conduct current after healing. And uh, it will be a self-healable magnetic field sensor because you use permalloy, you conduct current, you measure change of voltage in the magnetic field, right? So it's a self-healable magnetic field sensor. You can do it the same even in water. So in principle, the concept become now round. You have your textile, which is uh, basically the smart textile. You break it simply by taking your T-shirt off. There's no problem. You put it in a washing machine with a small magnet and uh, it can self-heal. Yeah? So like, now it becomes okay. Uh, it's a, there is no product on this, but it kind, kind of conceptually it becomes a round story, right? Which people can start thinking that this is uh, interesting. So this is a problem. In principle, everything what we are connect, uh, creating here uh, today, cobalt, iron was mentioned, permalloy was mentioned. Uh, Kai, which materials did you use in your 
uh, in ion wires, also some cobalt contain containing, I think, right? Uh, so basically, usually we use materials which have nickel and cobalt. Nickel and cobalt are toxic materials. You know, if you will check the material safety data sheet, it's a, it's a very funny thing to read. Um, it's actually quite uh, <laughs> not healthy and environmentally not friendly. Let's, let's make it simple. So in principle, everything that we produce here, uh, it will end up there. And uh, until we can uh, send it to Africa, probably people don't really worry here, but this is not a way to do it. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there is no drive to recycle soft magnetic materials. And it's very simple to understand why, because soft magnetic materials and magnetic field sensors are cheap. So there is no economic drive to recycle. And therefore, trashing and buying a new one is actually exactly what industry wants. Okay, so that's absolutely fine. That makes sense. Commercially, it absolutely makes sense. Um, still, this does not solve this problem, and there is no possibility to recycle. And um, there, is, there are initiatives in the European Union, a level where you have uh, think about this resilience calls on European Union. I don't know, maybe some of you applied there. Um, they don't un understand why you should recycle soft magnetic materials. As simple as that. They don't understand it, and that's, that's, that's it. That's end of the game. Uh, permanent magnets, it's fine, because permanent magnets, there is this uh, lobby on the European Union, uh, because uh, there are rare earths, and uh, you have to kind of balance everything with China. That's understandable. That's where you can get money. But soft magnetic materials, which are polluting like crazy, it's actually something which people don't care. Okay? So that's, uh, that's something to think about. Um, can you fabricate self-healable, but maybe also biocompatible, biodegradable magnetic field sensor? Because biodegradable makes sense only if your elements which you use is biocompatible. Otherwise, just imagine you will have biodegradable sensor which has permalloy. Well, you pollute, okay? So that that's, uh, has to be conceptually round again. And uh, that's what we did very fast for long night of sciences. It's, it's some in Germany, such kind of thing where general public is invited to, to universities, institutes, just to play a little bit with technologies. And this is a claim now. So now a claim yeah, that you can take starch from the shop, you can get vitamin C also from the shop, and you can buy iron particles also from the shop. And if you will mix all this together in a proper way, you will be able to create magnetic field sensor, which can be printed and self uh, healable and biocompatible and biodegradable, okay? So this is fun. This is fun, which you can literally do at the kitchen with your children if you want. And the performance of these sensors is actually not so bad, okay? So this is a this is very, very interesting surprise that you can take potato-based magnetic field sensor and it will actually have, I don't know, IMR of about 3%, okay? So this is kind of surprise what, what, what comes about. Um, uh, that, that, that was done as a fun, maybe we will publish it once, because I think it's pretty cool yeah? that you can really make something which you can even eat. In principle, you can eat that thing as a magnetic field sensor, okay? So there is no other magnetic field sensor which you should eat, but this one actually you can eat yeah? if you want. Um, so if you think about applications, uh, obviously, uh, the problem is that uh, we discuss a lot of applications, but we never do products, okay? Uh, application development makes sense usually only if eventually you come to the product. Uh, you or your students, or you will somehow spin off or do technology transfer. And uh, um, I think uh, here we are not doing very well. Uh, and magnetism community in general, we are very, very um, fundamentally biased. I don't know why. Uh, maybe there is a good reason for this, uh, one has to think about it. But I think it, we have way too little activities on technology transfer. But uh, luckily it comes because um, with all this flexible printed uh, stuff, you can, uh, you can start now thinking about new types of uh, markets uh, which uh, are not occupied. And that's exactly if you have a student which, is, uh, which has at least affinity to technology transfer, they can <coughs> take this idea and try to get a little bit of funding to spin off. And that's exactly... I don't know the business model of uh, Amalio with, uh, with his software, but that's exactly something what we are also trying to do, that uh, we try to put the technology uh, basically public. In a way, uh, how you want to do that, I, I don't know. You do it openly, available, and uh, try to, to, to finance it probably from your cost somehow, 
but uh, we do it, uh, we try to do it also commercially because I think such kind of uh, drive is very important. If you have a new, it's not only we, it's, but it's many other groups luckily. Uh, it's not only material scientists who can benefit from this because uh, you know, sometimes you like material science, sometimes you like polymers, uh, sometimes you don't, but you are good in uh, measurements. And in this case, if you have a new type of sensor, for example, flexible sensor, which uh, has also all this um, monodestructive influences, you have to compensate for them. And in this case, uh, even if you know how to condition, basically how to measure your sensor, it also can be a possibility to spin off, right? So such kind of things uh, for young students is very good. Uh, what is interesting here, that uh, when you think about such kind of large area applications, when you put something on, on skin, uh, Psychologically, you believe that it's super easy and there is nothing special there. But if you start mm -hmm. thinking about it, actually there are a lot of very interesting aspects. So if you do such kind of thing, you know, if you do such kind of thing, your skin stretches 100% biaxially, okay? So basically biaxial stretchability of your skin on this simple motion is 100%. It's very difficult to study it on skin, by the way, but uh, if you will do it on polymer, so basically you can use viscoelastic uh, polymer, uh, put your sensor on top of it, and uh, let it wrinkle, okay? So if uh, there are only two ways how to relax strain. One is wrinkling, that's shown here, and another one is rolling, which was shown by, uh, by, by Amalio in his talk, right? So there are only two ways how thin film with a sickness radiant, um, for example, or strain radiant along the sickness can relax strain. So that's exactly what is happening here. And if you will have a look, 100% stretchability will create wrinkles at a level of a couple of micron. And there are even wiggles here, uh, which are less than, let's say, micron. And this is now a very funny puzzle, uh, because um, when we were submitting it in this paper, one of the referees asked us, why does it need break? Because it's a very natural question. You know, you have a 100 nanometer thick GMR film, you bend it to, let's say, 100 nanometer, and it still works, yeah? And uh, we, we, we didn't know, we simply wrote, well, we don't know. It simply works, yeah? Uh, we got downgraded from Nature Materials to Nature Communication, but uh, after almost 10 years, we still don't know why it does it work, okay? So as simple as that. If there is somebody in structural mechanics who can explain <laughs> this, I would be very, very happy, right? So you can have your magnetics in film obviously bent to that thing, and uh, it still will work. Now the question is why? And it's a lot of activities what people do at the nanoscale, right? So exactly to understand what is actually happening, why does your sample work if you bend it, if you twist it, if you, uh, if you deform it somehow? And uh, all these beautiful things was already presented by, by Amalio with uh, different technologies, how you can fabricate 3D nanostructures. Uh, there will be a lot of talks how you can characterize nanostructures in 3D because uh, you need to have tomography. So here, uh, MFM, and uh, it's, it's, it's a very important type of measurement, but at the same time, you sometimes need to know what is happening at uh, different sides of your structure. You know, how magnetization reversal is actually happening in the entire tubular structure. This is a rolled up tube. And uh, tomography, electron or X-ray, doesn't matter is very, very, very important here. That was done with, with Peter at that time uh, at uh, ILS still. And um, I, I think it's very, very important kind of initial discussion about that. And uh, as if you can see, so I will not go through all, this, uh, all these different aspects. There are a lot of activities on uh, curvilinear type of structures or three-dimensional structures uh, because uh, community is very diverse. And if you can see, even from references, you know, 2010, uh, 2016, so this already an established research field, you know, people play with this already for a long, long, long time. Um, and uh, everybody can find his or her uh, field of interest, because if you are crazy about uh, spin waves, well, you do spin waves in such kind of structures. If you're interested uh, in domain walls, like, like we are interested in domain walls, that was very inspiring, and uh, the paper of, uh, uh, of Ricardo, 2010, Ricardo, it was very inspiring, for example, for me, uh, that from that time I started to like tubes. Uh, we, we don't do tubes, but, uh, but I started to like tubes because it's really nice, nice geometry, right? Um, and uh, simple transport, magnetotransport, when you can separate, because curvature allows you to have different scalings, right? Different scaling on magnetotransport and on resistivity. 
And in this case, you can separate spin resistance and charge resistance in 3D structures. So this is something which is very important if you want to do exactly this uh, since what uh, uh, Amalia was telling, interlayer communication. You have to separate charge and spin resistances. And 3D channels can allow you to do that. Um, that's uh, all the skirmions and type of things, uh, auto motion. Very, very exciting, different research fields which can attract a lot of people to this community. You see? So that's, that's exactly how it works. Something which is discussed very, very little, and this is a pity, uh, is exactly this part of stories where uh, Damien Fourier and uh, also uh, the Kundli is doing very much um, to understand the effects of strain. Strain effects are very exciting. It's not only magnetostriction, because magnetostriction is something which is related to, uh, you know, it's more like an anisotropy. If you think about it, uh, it's, it's more like an anisotropy. So in this case, if you conceptually think about it, having magnetostriction, well, well you just renormalize a little bit anisotropy, shift some levels, and you are good. The funny thing about magnetomechanics, at least in antiferromagnets, it's a long-range interaction. Okay, it's like magnetostatics in ferromagnets. So the uh, magnetostriction or magnetomechanics in general, it's something which is very, very, very exciting. And uh, using, in this case, it's a use of method. It's not uh, magnetization dynamics per se is as important, exciting thing, but you use it as a tool to access something which is hardly accessible in any other way. Therefore, these activities, I think, are very, very important. You know, this flexible magnonics and uh, other kind of concepts which are developing here, they are very, very interesting. Three-dimensional magnonics, uh, which, uh, which is pushed by Jean-Luca, this is also super exciting, uh, where you have three-dimensional structures. In this case, maybe you don't necessarily explore the effects of, uh, which we will discuss now about uh, DMI and anisotropies, but simply three-dimensionality and boundary conditions can already give you a lot of excitement here, right? So this, uh, Jean-Luc will obviously cover it in his talk, so I will spare my time. Um, very much uh, important is the understanding. So basically, uh, calculation of three-dimensional structures um, uh, were done already for decades. And uh, I, I remember 2008 PRB from uh, Ricardo, where you had this concave structure, right, Ricardo, and you had uh, vortex deformation there already. So this is, a, th this is all something which you can calculate. You just have a proper solver which uh, properly puts uh, the coordinate system because you need to properly account for spatial derivatives there. And if everything is correct, you can calculate your system without any other understanding. The problem is that micromagnetics sometimes gives you an answer, but you don't understand why it happens. Right? And therefore, this what, uh, was, what was done by the group of Yuri Heididay and Dennis Shekha, uh, I think was very influential and it actually sparked a lot of interest in this, uh, in this field because uh, basically the um, concept of curvilinear magnetism uh, simply translates the effects which you have in three-dimensional geometries in a language which you can easily understand. You know, like we speak language of anisotropies, DMI, you know, some exchange, some basic interactions. And uh, this is exactly the uh, theory which uh, I will never make it in two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I will try. <laughs> but I will try. Yeah? Um, so the, the, it simply translates it in the language which we all understand easily, right? So there will be some chiral interaction and anisotropic interaction. This will be covered by Dennis uh, Shekha in his talk. But for us, it's important to have uh, like a uh, knowledge that if you are, have a local system here in dozen, local interactions like exchange and anisotropy, uh, for statics, you can put here different vector fields. Can be magnetization, can be vector, uh, near vector. So for antiferromagnets, it will be exactly the same story. Uh, that you will have eventually your thin film, which you geometrically curve, will uh, expand. Like behave as it has anisotropy, additional anisotropy, and zelashinsky maria interaction. So this is relatively straightforward thing because when you do geometric transformation, they simply take a tensor, you just transform it. It has nothing to do with physics, right? It's basically coordinate transformation. Uh, if you will have uh, derivatives, special derivatives, you will necessarily have uh, geometric potential and scalar potential. In different fields, these two potentials are called different, like in magnetism we call them Zelashinsky Maria and anisotropy, okay? But uh, in semiconductors, they would feel, uh, call it different, okay? But uh, otherwise, we will have exactly these two things. 
And if you know about that, uh, a lot of things becomes very, very simple. Because, for example, you can easily understand uh, that if you will have your magnetic, ferromagnetic stripe, it's just a permaloid, 20 nanometer sec permaloid, you just bend it a little bit here, and you will have curvature gradient. And curvature gradient will pin the main wall, and uh, not only pin, but it will uh, select chirality of this domain wall. So in, in, it means that the sense of rotation will be simply defined in which direction your magnetization is pointing here. As simple as that. So this is a translation of some complex effects to a very simple language. If you know about this zelushinsky murray interaction, you can tell, okay, if I will have such kind of uh, system, I will have necessarily space inversion broken here, right? And that means that I will have kind of chiral effects by default there, therefore, these domain walls will be of certain chirality, okay? That's, that's it. So you will have skirmion bubbles, if you want, defined by geometry. You can have curvature very high, so here you will have really skirmion, as, as you know, skirmion in simple permaloy film or, or cobalt platinum film without DMI, with symmetric stack. Yeah? So symmetric stack will have you very standard skirmion without any zelushinsky murray interaction. Yeah? So if you know that, everything else becomes very simple. There are a lot of things which are related not to local interactions, because this is all about local interactions and uh, everything related to, to, to skirmions and everything, domain walls, you can uh, already start understanding. But there are non-local interactions, and this is work of Denis and uh, Shaka and uh, Alexander Polipovsky, uh, where they really tried to explore the impact of magnetostatics in general, also not only local magnetostatics when you have anisotropy, but also uh, non-local magnetostatics. Um, and the uh, funny thing here, that you can come to the point where you will have, uh, where you will have uh, possibility to have such energy terms, which are shown here, uh, which uh, simply believe me, because now I'm skipping like, I don't know, 30 pages of uh, analytics, but you can believe me that uh, these uh, terms, they support chiral symmetry break. So basically, there will be two domain walls, for example, which are energetically different. And the funny thing is that you have in the kernel here one over distance which is divergent, so basically it's a non-local, right? So you have non-local chiral symmetry break, which is pretty funny. Uh, and uh, now I think I have to stop, but there are a lot of nice things which can be still discussed, and uh, uh, such kind of uh, stories about uh, modifications of textures in uh, this uh, type of curved geometries, which were also briefly mentioned by Amalio, where you will have uh, twists of vortex string in such kind of uh, low symmetric magnetic caps. You can explore a lot of things about, related about, to symmetry lowering in these structures and how it affects the state selection. You can think about topology, right? So I'm simply scrolling in one minute, I'm done. Yeah. And uh, topology here is also a very beautiful thing because uh, basically uh, three-dimensionality, and this is very important now, I think I, I have to tell it. Uh, three-dimensionality brings you um, like out of this uh, planar, picture where you will have two different type of topologies which are related to texture and to band structure. You know, these topological insulators and skirmions which we all discuss, uh, which is related to geometry, right? So this is very, very important because geometry becomes very important player in 3D because it gives you additional topological constraint on your magnetization vector field, okay? And if you have that, then you will have a very interesting possibility to manipulate textures. And that's exactly curvilinear magnetism about. It's a combination of topology of the texture and the topology of the geometry. So these two things, it's exactly what you can start exploring in 3D. That's exactly why 3D is exciting, okay? So like uh, if I would need to make a very simple message, uh, I would say this is probably the most impactful part of the story. And uh, uh, here it's only because Philippe is in the audience, I have to show one image. Uh, and this image is this one, you can play with topology. And topology uh, is something which constrains vector field, okay? So basically, if you will have uh, all these uh, structures which Sam is doing, and uh, Amalio and uh, uh, Michael Hood in, uh, uh, are doing, you can easily fabricate soft magnetic materials, like cobalt iron, right? Uh, in the form of n-pods, like tetrapod, tripod, pentapod, whatever you want. And that's actually quite interesting because it simply tells you how many, uh, let's say, vortices and anti-vortices you will have in your structure. You know, this is very, very fundamental here because if you will have, for example, n port, it's homeotopic to a certain object. And it's homeotopic to a sphere, like spherical shell, which has a very specific Euler characteristic, which is plus two, okay? 
So it means that if you will have n pod, any n pod will support n vortices and necessarily n minus two anti vortices, okay? And this will be a ground state. So this is very, very cool because uh, you will have always excess of two uh, vortices in your system. And you can now play with topology. You can put simply a link. And I think for you guys, putting a link here is at the limit of being trivial, right, Amalia? Yeah, <laughs> I think so. And then you have an uh, object with a link which will have a completely different topology, it's a torus. And torus has a Euler characteristic zero, okay? It means that the number of vortices must be equal to number of anti-vortices, okay? And they will be stable, okay? If you will now play with it further, you put such kinds of objects. Amalio showed way more complex objects in his talk, right? Here, you will have so-called n-tori or n-torus and uh, Euler characteristic for this thing is uh, two one minus n, okay? One minus n for tori would mean that it's always kind of negative. So you will have a lot of anti-vortices here and that's what you can do. So now with topology, basically you can simply constrain your vector field to anything you want, right? And uh, luckily you can do it experimentally, which is super exciting because now you can explore these things what uh, Claire was putting in her uh, nature nanotechnology where you can start exploring magnetic stray fields, which are very complex in the structure, which has many solitons. So if you have solitons, which is there as a ground state, in principle, you will have very complex near fields. And that's exactly what you can do with such kind of structures. That's, that's why topology is so, so important and magnetic soft structures are very important. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Sorry for the delay.